one founder of United Masters. Let's go. Y'all yeah, love this. I love this. Gas me up. Come on. Gas me up. Gas me up. I like this type of action. Go ahead, Paige. Once again, introducing Issa Ray. Wait a minute. <laughs> Go on, Queen. Shine, Queen. Shine, Queen. Hello, hello. Hey, everybody. Very happy to be here. Hey. <laughs> Y'all are live. Y'all been drinking too? I've been drinking, okay. That's what that is. Got it. Y'all been smoking too. I we made a decision been. backstage that we were going to pregame. So the pregame is in play. So, ladies and gentlemen, what we want to do, honestly, we're going to go through some of, you know, we're going to take you, I'm going to take you through each story. But this is all about learning, education, and applying these lessons from this entrepreneur and how it could affect what you guys are building, how you approach your everyday life with wanting to grow and build your business. And I think that's the most valuable aspect of what you get at SelectCon. So that's what you came for, and that's what you're going to get. All right. So let's just start with basic housekeeping. What were your original uh, aspirations when you went to Stanford? Man, when I was in college, I wanted to create. I think I wanted to act initially. I come from high school, like we all do after college, right, for the most part. <laughs> And I had uh, entertainment ambitions. I knew I wanted to write. Uh, but, you know, my dad was like, you're at Stanford. You need to do something practical. And so I was like, OK, well, I'll do law, I guess. And um, that didn't really work out for me. So when you went to college, you went there. Were you, were you considering not even going to college, or you had to go there because your parents had the pressure on? No, I never considered not going to college. Yeah, I, I, I wanted to go to NYU. Specifically because, because of film. Okay, because of film and because they had such a strong arts program. Mm -hmm. And 9-11 had just kind of happened. And so my parents were just, my mom was like, no, I'm not sending you over there at all. And so I was like, Ugh. and so they made me apply to Stanford just because it was so close. And I didn't want to go there. I remember crying, filling out the application. Like, y'all are ruining my life. But then when I went to go visit there, I was just like, this is great. It has a great black community, too. And when mm -hmm. I went to NYU, no offense to the girl that just, woo. But it didn't really have, it didn't have a campus. And it didn't feel like it had a community. Um, and there was just something I liked about what Stanford had to offer. And to be honest, I saw a dude in a Bulls jersey who was kind of fine in a wave cap walking. And I was like, this is my school. OK. <laughs> so 2007. Dorm Room Diaries, or Dorm Diaries, and 2011, Awkward Black Girl. What made you lean into YouTube? What, Ma made, you, what made you decide this is the platform, and what was your ambitions with the show? You know, even though I don't fuck with it at all now, Facebook was everything to me at the time because it started, you know, as a as a college community building platform. And I would just stay on it and I would procrastinate. And I remember, you know, YouTube was equally as fun, but it was mostly videos of, you know, people just doing random things, cat video, animal videos, Scarlet takes a tumble, like those kind of things were, were you know, the waffle do, waffle fries, like him. And it was things that we would circulate, but there wasn't really any content. And as a writer, uh, I had spent, time trying to break into the industry when I was in college, like entering the Sundance uh, Film Festival writing competition and taking time off of school to go to LA to pursue um, a script that I had co-written with a friend. And you know, I kept on hearing a lot of what you're making, there's not an audience for just this anymore. So like, for example, we had a, a screenplay that was about a uh, black jazz, uh, jazz singer and it was like, it sounds boring, but it was lit. It was really like a, a good script. And it was like, a, a, it, it was in the vein of, of like a Love Jones. And we didn't have those movies mm -hmm. 
back then. And so we missed it and we're craving it. And the response that we were getting was that like that era is over and there's not just an audience for people who want black romantic movies. And so um, I was really getting discouraged. And then YouTube for me was just a platform that was just available and where I could just rent the, li rent the camera from my library and just make videos and have my Facebook audience watch it and support it. And that was exercising my creative muscle. And then it would spread to other colleges and other networks. And that's what made me realize like, okay, these people out here are saying there isn't an audience, but they're fucking with my content. And that means that it does have an audience. So somebody's lying. Yeah. Okay, whoa, 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 whoa. Just, Thank you so much. So, like, I just want to pull back a second. She said that she rented the camera and started making videos. So, right now, her cost basis is renting a camera. So, this whole idea of what you need and all the questions about how do I get started, you just heard from somebody we all admire that it was about renting a camera from her college and cutting it on and doing her thing and posting it, and that's how she got started, okay? Yeah, give it up for that. Because, like, you want to hear these stories, but the thing you want to really get is the struggle. Like, you, you, we know what it looks like now. What did it look like then? So we're going to get into what it looks like then, because I think that's the part that's going to be most beneficial in this conversation. So how did you finance yourself while making uh, Awkward Black Girl? I didn't. You know, just to, to that, like, I learned everything. Everything I could learn because I didn't want to have to rely on people. Uh, because that's another thing when you're a creative, like, you're like, oh, I have this amazing idea, but I need a director. I need, or I need an editor. So I learned how to edit. I learned to the best of my ability how to direct. Um, I learned how to DP, which meant like looking at three light setups. And it was terrible, but it at least got me it, it, it got it done in a way so that I didn't have to sit back and be mad that it wasn't getting done. And so for me, like, Awkward Black Girl was able to come about because, like, I just had to learn the skills necessary. And I have great friends who were just down. I went to, you know, uh, a friend who, was, who told me, like, who was a dancer who was like, I want to get into acting. And I was like, well, cool, because I'm trying to start this web series. Will you be in it? And he was like, yeah. And eventually, when, when I finally put the first episode out, people saw that I was serious about this idea, and they started coming to me like, hey, do you need help? Or, hey, I'm an actor. Or, hey, I'm a DP. Can I help you? And I'm a, I want to be a producer. Can I help you? And so I started to build a team from that. And um, it just grew with the kind of community of people that I had around me. Right, so like, if you're doing your thing and people feel that you're taking it seriously, then it's like, they, it's like a campfire. People come around, they want to lend support, they lend advice, they do things to help you move your shit forward, which is very important. But if they don't see you taking that first step but just talking about it but not doing it, you don't get that momentum and people coming to your aid. Did anyone give you any advice during that period in that early beginning that stuck with you to this day? And what's that advice? Um, bad advice, yeah. Um... <laughs> We want to hear the bad advice. Yeah, I mean the... Let's hear some of the dumbass ideas they told you. <laughs> it was more just discouragement, you know? Like, I had friends who were in the, in the industry or making their way haters. in. <laughs> Not even haters. I still, <laughs> we're still friends. But um, they were just... One, one was for Awkward Black Girl when I... Usually I don't tell my ideas to anyone because... There are, you know, sometimes people subconsciously hate and they bring bad energy off of your thing and they might doubt it and it's just like, I don't want, I don't want that negative energy. You might, and you might, you know, maybe they're not even, they're, they're not consciously doing, but, it, but you might say the idea and they might twitch their face and then you might get discouraged. So I just don't want any reason to discourage myself. And so, you know, like this one person, I told him, like, I'm thinking about doing this animated series called... Um, the Misadventures of Awkward Black Girl, and I kind of told him about it, and he was like, yo, that's really dope, but you got to take Black out the title. And I was like, why? And he was like, well, because if you put Black in the title, you're limiting yourself. You know, you're limiting who's going to want to watch it, because they might see Black 
and they might be like, oh, this ain't for me, or oh, I don't want to watch this. And I'm like, if they see black in there and don't want to watch it, I don't want them to yes, watch sir. it. Why yeah. would I want that? I don't want that audience. You know, that reminds me, we were just talking, we were talking backstage about an, an entrepreneur that we both uh, admire, um, Angie, who started Shade Room. And she tells a story of when she started Shade Room, she was also a screenwriter. Uh, and she went to Sundance Festival and uh, her boy, she was an accountant. Uh, she had an, a bookkeeping job. And she goes to Sundance Festival uh, for a contest. And because she qualified, she had to stay an extra week, but she had to go back to work. So that extra week was gonna fuck shit up. And her boss said, look, if you don't come back today, you're done. And so she didn't come back. <laughs> Right, and she didn't win. <laughs> um, however, so she had two months rent in her pocket, and she stuck it out. And when she went and started the idea for Shade Room, she went to the bank, and it was a black girl at the bank, and she's to open up the corporate account, and she said it's Shade Room, and she said if you name a company that, no one's gonna come to the site. Literally. They just tried to stop it right there, and that's that negative energy. I say to people all the time, man, if you have a rational idea that makes perfect sense, and people criticize it, that means you have a genius idea. Amen to that. Um, you signed an you signed a non traditional contract with HBO. Okay, so here we go. Awkward girl is going. An awkward black girl is moving. It's getting views on YouTube. It's moving. She's getting awareness, people are paying attention. And now, 2013, HBO comes along. Tell me some of your must-have conditions in that contract, and what did they try to take away that you did, if anything? They didn't, first of all, there wasn't like a, an amazing contract for the 2013 <laughs> deal. That was just a, like, I was hungry. I was like, oh, y'all want a shot? Yeah, y'all want a shot, I got you, I got you. Um, you know, I'll do it for free. But eventually, you know, when the show became successful, then it became renegotiation time. And so for me, it was just about, you know, making sure what I do like is my, my team and I appreciate is my team values me. And sometimes they see, they see more of my worth than I do at the time because my head is so, so into it. And so they like to have a team around me that can ask for beyond what you almost value yourself is is extremely important. And I think that that really comes around to this latest deal, you know? And it, for me, I've done, I haven't done much, right? I've had, I've written a TV show that you've seen and a web series and a book. I haven't done that much in my mind, right? Um, let me, <laughs> like I have so much more to do and so to be able to, you know, have the opportunity on a larger scale to continue to create is a dream come true for me. And, you know, sometimes we act just grateful to be here, which I am, but that doesn't mean that you should sell yourself short. And so that's something that I'm continuing yeah, to learn. Yeah. I'm trying to, girl. Thank you. Free game. Free game. <laughs> so that, that for me is recognizing my, my own value is something that I'm, I'm, I'm coming into. And so there are certain mandates that now I'm, I'm starting to require. So, but you did one thing. Why did you change the name from Awkward Black Girl to Insecure, but you kept the IP of Awkward Black Girl? There were two different shows. So I had Awkward Black Girl was on YouTube. We did two seasons. We had 24 episodes. And I was like, okay, I'm done with this. And I feel like that's an existing body of work that's gonna live online. And then with Thank You, with, and then with, with uh, insecure, I wanted a whole new show. Awkward Black Girl, I was also like 24, 25 when I came up with the idea. Insecure, I wanted to represent more of who I was okay. at this time, and I wanted it to feel grown. I wanted it to feel like an HBO show. So for me, it was still, but it was still starring me. So like at that time, I felt, you know, kind of insecure. So Awkward Black Girl, you still, that's your IP. That's my IP. That's for my sure. IP. Yeah. So you may do something with that down the line. Yes. Yeah, stay tuned. Whoa! So now we're gonna move right into Issa's support of the black community. You give black creatives opportunities from every level. Interns, makeup artists, writers, and more. 
You've seen the shift in the industry since you started the Trailblaze. Do you feel that, that there's a big change in Hollywood? And do you, do you feel like everything that you're doing to support young black creatives is making a difference? Yes, I do. Um, I see the tides changing. I see an effort being made. Um, I'm not claiming any responsibility for that, but I know that we have heralded it, and I know that we have um, mandated it on our side. Like that was very, very important to us in creating the show. For when I went, when when I got my opportunity to create the pilot, I was just like. I know the people that have been working with me since Awkward Black Girl, I want to be able to give them opportunities. And it's not as easy as it sounds. It's hard because they will fight you at every level because it's about experience, you know? And that's how they, that's what they use to keep us out this industry is just like, they're not experienced enough. What have they done? Even though they'll give like a white man who's directed a short, the next X-Men movie, you know? Like for us, it's, it time. just takes more to prove ourselves. And it, and, and it takes us to take a chance on us to, to be able to do more. And so I know that we, w with this pilot, I just knew like if, even if the show didn't get, get picked up, people would get the experience to say that they worked on this pilot to be able to get their next job. And that's kind of what we, um, that, that's the mentality we had as the show continued about like giving people chances, but they still had to be good. And also not doing the thing where we just support people because they're black. Like we have to make sure that they are good because at, they need to be. They need to be. You have to be because people will doubt you at every turn. They will find a reason for you not to be. Um, and so that's, that's been essential. And I have seen more efforts being made within the industry to have more inclusion and to get people behind the scenes. But sometimes I, I think that within the industry, um, a lot of white Hollywood thinks that diversity just means white women and that it really hasn't trickled down to behind the scenes just yet. So you'll see like a, like a diverse cast or crew and it'll just be like, oh, y'all just put more white women in here, but it's still like all white. Um, so there's, there's a lot of work that needs to be done and a lot of examples that need to be set. Uh, but you know, I'm committed. Well, y your commitment, um, is, is clear with you, you know, I, I'm looking right now at your, your organizational structure and it seems like you're trying to build the next Disney. That's your aspiration and you've been, not been shy about that. Um, so at Hooray, you have, um, you have movies, you have your music company, radio, you got Hilltop Coffee, a coffee shop, right? And you have a relationship with Patreon and what you do, uh, obviously what Patreon does, uh, crowdsourcing, and just everything that you're building with Insecure and now your production deal that you just signed, you have so many tentacles. How do you balance being a creative and a CEO? And I, and I just wanna talk about that for a second because I've watched some of the great you know, creatives be CEOs, Jay-Z being one of them, Diddy, who you've looked up to, being one of them. You've, you've looked at what these people have done. Oprah being one of them. How do you balance being a creative and a CEO? I hire well. That's how I balance it, honestly. And I trust who I hire because it's not, doesn't make sense to, he's drinking Japanese whiskey. It's really good. <laughs> I am too. Um, I'm drinking Diageo. <laughs> oh, just kidding, he's drinking Diageo. And that's good too. Uh, but um, yeah, I, I don't think that it's possible to be a, a CEO, a great CEO and a great creative. I'm just gonna say that. Uh, I think that you need help and you need to, that, that balance that you achieve is in the people that you trust. Uh, because I realize like, for me, I have to be able to focus on one to be great. And it's a full, both are full-time jobs. I have looked up in one year and realized, oh my gosh, I've only done business shit and I have not created anything new. And that makes me feel bad. And in, you know, in the last year, I've been so tunnel vision focused on creative that you know, I, I realized my company is suffering. And so for me, that is, I'm making a conscious effort to make sure 
that I achieve that balance and that comes in the infrastructure, that comes in seeking guidance, that comes in asking for help, that comes in talking to peers, but I'm always, I, I never think that I'm, I'm, I'm doing anything completely right. And I think you always have to constantly question like, what am I missing? And I have, the other thing that I'm really grateful for is that I don't have, yes, people around me. I have people that aren't afraid to call me out. I have one team member in particular, um, Benoni, <laughs> who was here earlier um, on a panel, and he is always my, hey, you're fucking up, morale is low here. You, you have to look out for this. Or, hey, you're missing, you have a blind spot to this, and we could be doing this. And I really appreciate that. I think you need someone to tell you, like, hey, uh, get your head out your own ass and focus on what's in front of you and, and, and look around you and, and just be better. Uh, because that's what I'm striving toward all the time, is just to, to be better. So that's, that's great advice. This idea of, of you know, harsh, factual criticism, where somebody gives you constructive, but it's harsh, it's transparent, that's not disrespect. That's love. And you got to really understand that. Like, this is a merit-based world. Forget industry. Like, it's a meritocracy, and if you're, not doing, if you're not doing what you need to do, ultimately, you will not win. And you need people around you to provide you that insight, because as you're going and building, you know, if you don't have somebody around you being like, yo, bro, you missed that, or yo, you did that, you need to chill out, you'll make critical mistakes. The other thing you said that was very important is she's not afraid to be curious and ask questions. So even with her success, she knows she ain't got it. She's striving. She's a work in progress. We're works in progress. It doesn't matter where you are. We're works in progress. That's important. That's what we all have in common. I just want you to be my translator for life. You know what I said, please. Break it down. Preach. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> so you said something that was dear to my heart. You talked about the music industry. And as most of you guys know, we started United Masters uh, five years ago. And it was, about, it was about artists taking control, owning their masters, owning their rights. And it was all of the years of fucked up shit that the record company has done. And I had seen it up close. But like you come in from Stanford and Insecure, with great soundtracks, by the way, great musical Insecure. But like, you go so hard. Let me give you some of your quotes that you had oh, when you got a record business. This is, the music industry needs a start over. Conflicts of interest abound. Archaic mentalities. You were my translator. <laughs> <laughs> but this, this one is a little, <laughs> this one is a little outside of my realm. Crooks and criminals. It's an abusive industry, and I really feel for the artists that have come up in it. When and how did you come to this conclusion and what led you to start radio? Give me the experience. That came from starting radio, to be honest. Uh, you know, I'm still learning. I'm still learning about this industry. And I, just being a creator, obviously value creators. And on the, the, the Hollywood side, do my best to make sure that there's a, there's a pipeline, that there's a comfort, that there's transparency. And I don't see that on the music side. And it's come from, you know, making deals where, you know, I can see that like lawyers, for example, can represent the label and the artist and that's okay. I have to sign, my lawyer has to tell me, hey, I represent this company so you should know this and maybe get another lawyer for this deal. But, and, and I don't see that happening with it. That's, that's fucking crazy. Why is, why is the, my, just not to go deep into it, but like that's, that's one part of it. In addition to obviously, um, licensing you know, music, you licensing like to do music and the deals there. I think 
Hollywood is not the standard for anything, but there are guild minimums and there are, um, there's the least amount that an artist can be paid. And that there's a protection there. And I don't think that artists are protected in that same way no. uh, at all. And I think that's why, you know, like these United Masters, like th these type of situations are so important just because there is transparency and there is ownership. Um, and there's just, there's just, there's so much. Like the executives of labels can also manage artists. It's just, it's a mix. It it's feels not, like it's, a mafia. It's, it's unbelievable what they do. It, it really is a sad business model that um, it, it is a form, it is a form of slavery. And, I, and it's very hard. That's when his I, when I use, he said it. When I use that word, well, it's fine. Well, they call, the, they call it masters for a reason. That's not a fake word. <laughs> Those are in those are in recording contracts. I'm not even joking around. I could, there are recording contracts in which the first original copy is the master, and the copies are called slaves. In the contract, this, this is not bullshit. This is this is normal. This is normal language. And it's it's continued to yeah. happen. Like what has changed? What's changed is, and we're gonna get about to get into that actually, that was a very good segue. So when I look at things, it goes from slavery, right, just form of competition. Just woo. No, stop, 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 slavery. stop, 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 stop. Woo. No, 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 the woo was for, hold on, time out. The woo was for, <laughs> Go time. hold on, woo. I'll defend you. Let me defend you. The woo was for when I said, when I look at things, woo. And then I was about to say what I was about to say. Let's, let's get into this. Come on, come on. Let's not. Forms of, forms of compensation went from slavery to the indentured servant to employment to ownership. Okay? And that's where we are today. We're talking about ownership. Tell me about Web3. You've always been on the forefront of technology. And even about getting into detail about Web3 or the metaverse or blockchain or crypto, you support transparency, you support those platforms. That's what those platforms are built for. Where are you at in that process? Um, so uh, Hooray might venture into that, yes. but I'm going to give you my stream of consciousness Go ahead. thoughts about it. Okay, please. This, the metaverse, NFTs, it just feels like sometimes, and not even sometimes, it feels like we're entering an era where we're placing a lot of value on the intangible and the non-physical, and that is scary. In, an, in, in a time when resources are becoming very scarce, mm -hmm. and that scares me, and so anything where billionaires are like, yeah, this is a thing, this is it, this is so, this cryptocurrency, this is it, this is the next thing, is like billionaires fuck with this, but how, so how is this good for me? How is this good no. for the average person? And, you know, obviously they're going to make a lot of money yeah. off of cryptocurrency. It benefits them. And even when you're thinking about, again, this is very stream of conscious, but when I think about, like, Elon buying Twitter, right, and, and his mandate being, like, we, want, we need to change free speech. We need, to, we need to make sure that we have free speech. And he doesn't care about everybody's free speech. He doesn't care about your free speech. He cares about his free speech, you know? Mm -hmm. He cares about the fact that when he was on Twitter and he would tweet about, you know, I'm, the, I'm gonna sell Tesla for this stock, the SEC got on his ass and was like, okay, you're fined. And he didn't like that. And he was like, that's my, that's my right to type out what I want. And so I low-key bought Twitter to be like, fuck you. SEC, this is my company now. It's private, and I can say what the fuck I want on some petty shit. And so in, in some ways, cryptocurrency to me feels like, did y'all ever get Vector, uh, the Vector? <laughs> the job interview. You go to the job interview for Vector. For those who don't know, when I was in high school, big shit. Got, got a letter when I turned 18 for a job interview. And I was like, they found me. I'm lit. Like, I'm about to go to college. Vector Marketing wants me, and you go there, and you go to a room like this, you go to a meeting, and it's a group interview, and you're already caught off guard, like, oh, damn, it's competitive already. 
cool, but I'm still going to kill this. And you can start planning in your mind, like the marketing, the marketing job, the outfits that I'm going to wear. I'm about to live a corporate life before I got to go to college. Great. And the marketing meeting, they have a guy pull up in a Ferrari. And he comes up on stage. And he's like, hey, I work at Vector. This could be your life. I make $100,000, $200,000 a year. This could be you. And you're like, well, how can it be me? And it's, it ends up being a pyramid scheme, you know? Like, they, it's the same, same situation. You're just making the person above you richer. So in a world of transparency, I just don't buy yet. And yeah. I will happily be proven wrong that it benefits us just yet. Us just yet. I get that. I get that. That's a, by the way... That was a very good, that, 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 that was a very transparent and stream of thought, I'm sure, shared by many. You know, what we've seen is at United Masters, so, you know, we pay out artists every month. And four years ago, artists wanted to get paid PayPal. Right? Pay me in PayPal every month. And as we started to expand, I started to see artists coming from outside of America. What you realized was that their government currency was unstable. So crypto was way more valuable to them. So if you live in Venezuela, or you live in Argentina, you much more trust Bitcoin than you trust your government currency. So they preferred to get paid in Bitcoin. And that's what pushed us into understanding where crypto was about in payments for artists, because you know, as much as, you know, we can criticize a lot of things about this country, uh, we have the best economy from a stability standpoint, where the dollar's a dollar and you can trust it. When you go to some of these other countries, you may wake up and your bank account's gone. So Bitcoin was a way of protecting them. Now, it doesn't change anything that you said about billionaires pushing it down at all. At all. At all. And, you know... NFTs are starting to, everybody's jumping in it, and it's gonna be a Ponzi scheme. But a lot of you guys are too young to remember, in 1999, that's what the internet was, right? There's yeah. articles I could post where the New York Times said the internet's not gonna work, it's fake. They talk about the internet that same way. They were oh, 99. Late. Oh, yeah, but remember, in 99 is when everything went crashed. <laughs> The Nikes? You're changing the topic, Ma. But anyhow, these transitions of when technology comes in or new technology causes this kind of disruption. And then there's companies that come out of it that eBay, Google, Amazon, they went through that. And another, a bunch of companies that failed, like whatever the fuck you say dot com, that one went bankrupt. So, you know, that's how it works in, in these transitions, and we have to be, to Issa's point, very patient and careful because you could throw your money behind trends and then end up fucked up. Yes, and to your point, I do think that there's refinement. I think there's ingenuity that will come out of this, ultimately, because, you know, we, we as humans, we create the best out of what we're given. Um, I'm curious to see that, but, you know, I'm not going to just jump in 10 toes down. And the number... What also makes me very, very distrusting is the number of deals that have come my way to advertise this to our people. Like specifically, like lots of fucking money <laughs> to be like, hey, we want you to advertise cryptocurrency because your demographic trusts you. And I'm like, well, then I, that matters to me. I'm not just going to sell them some shit, sell people some shit just because, you know, and I don't yeah. have that value. Yeah, give it up that's, for that. That's... That's that. That's crazy. So I'm like, why are we, why are we so targeted for this? Well, the fact that you protect your brand, and that you protect the people who love you, and you're not going to sell something you don't believe in, is unfortunately rare and far and few between today. Because we've seen some of our greatest artists sell shit that we know they don't fuck with. <laughs> Okay, uh, what's next? So you, you know, you, you, you said you take time, you, you took time, there's so much more you wanna do. What's next? Yeah, I mean, I took a lot of time Give off. Give us broad strokes. 
broad strokes, I want broad strokes. I want a studio uh, in LA and South LA specifically. Um, I want to continue to build in my community. There's just so many things like in in the Disney grid that you shared. Um, like there's just so many opportunities to help develop, you know, my neighborhood and surrounding neighborhoods. Uh, I want to continue to. I, I want to. I just want to kill it in this in this field. You know, I think I have so much, so many more stories to tell, so many more people to support, um, storytellers that I believe in, and I just feel like I'm just getting started. So broad strokes, more TV shows. I have a new TV show coming out in Ju July that I'm really proud of. I don't even know if I'm able to say that. Um, and a couple more movies that I'm writing, but I'm just creating more this year. I think I realized, you know, in taking roles, like that's cool, but my power comes in creating, and, and you know, sometimes I forget that. Like, I, that's, that's not necessarily a common thing. I don't have to wait for the next job. I can create the next job, and that really, that's powerful. Let me unpack some of that, please, because that was a lot you just said. <laughs> She's a, she forms the idea and then sells the idea. You can't take it from her because she births it. Right? But this is a, this is a very important thing because there's a lot of talk and like your intellectual property, the ideas that you come up with, the things that inspire you and you say them and you put those things out in the world, if you don't protect them, people would take them. And the people who take them try to act like they ain't shit when they hear it. So, so, <laughs> protecting that part is critical. And you have to remind yourself that you, you birthed those ideas. Like she just said, I, I'm like, I don't, I don't need to rely on anybody. I could do it myself. And you can all do it yourselves. We all have talent. It's something that we, we possess inside of us that if we just tap into it and believe in it and put it out there in the world, you know, it, it will be rewarded. But you have to believe in it. And you can't run from it. You got to chase it down and, and chase those dreams. For me, in this conversation, when I was doing all my homework on ESA, I, I couldn't believe, like, I felt like, you were born in the, in, like you came from my generation. Like, because when I speak to you, it's like speaking to Jay or Puff or people who came where we just used hip hop and we didn't know what the fuck we was doing, but we knew that if people like hip hop, we could make clothes and we could make this and we could make that. And, 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 and you have that same level of energy. Because we that's... watched y'all. We watched y'all. We watched y'all do, you know? And I think that that's, to be able to come up during that time and observe and have the blueprint to look at within a genre that you guys made massive, you guys made popular culture. I think you can't watch that and grow up in that and not imagine what's possible in whatever respective field that you are in. And so, that's dope. you know, thank you guys for that blueprint because you don't, obviously, if you, if you can't see it, you can't achieve it. And so much of that to be able to see black people, black men and women become these massively successful entrepreneurs when people discounted the genre uh, is just wildly inspiring. It's, so when I was coming up, I. I learned very early, when I went to the advertising business, I was 34 years old. Well, let me go back before that. I was like, when I was like uh, 32, I would bring, so this is 2002, 2001, I would bring Jay-Z to meetings to meet corporations. And they didn't give a fuck about him at all. I, it was the craziest thing because as big as he was in the world that I lived in, we couldn't get arrested in a corporation. They wouldn't pay attention to us. They wouldn't look at him in the face. It was that kind of thing. And to this day, I tell companies when they, start, when they try to hire me now, because they, you know, the, we, you know, we ring in, and I'm telling them, ethnic insights ultimately would lead to mainstream insights. Number Every one. time. Ethnic insights will lead to mainstream insights. Number two, if you have a diversity problem at the top, you have a youth problem at the bottom. 
So it's not, it's, it's to your benefit. All of the values that East is talking about, hiring diversity, giving people opportunities, not, not you know, like, even if, it, even if their resume isn't there yet, like betting on them because their counterpart are getting shots with nothing. Like very little, and they say they're getting much better opportunities. These are things that we all have to do. They're very, very important because if we don't do that, we are not going to be able to help the next generation get the opportunities that they deserve. And it's like what you're doing in Hollywood, you're breaking down walls. And as a black woman doing it, it's, I'm not, there's not many of you. We have to protect you. We have to support you. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I feel supported. And again, it really is not anything that I'm doing by myself. And I feel so, so fortunate to have people who believe in me that I believe in um, to, to be able to continue on this journey. I want the longevity and I don't want to be, you know, just a, a flash in, in the pan moment of history. And I think you've passed that part. <laughs> Just so you know, you're on the other side of that. Just so, could y'all tell us she's on the way on the other side of that? <laughs> I wasn't fishing. Thank you. Well, that's my name. Thank you. <laughs> you are so funny. Y'all are Thank Capricorns. Where the Capricorns at? I know y'all got the work ethic. Who else? Where the Virgos at? That's, that's all I know that works really hard. Only those two signs? Yeah, what's your sign? I'm a cancer. Y'all are sensitive. That doesn't work? That my doesn't play well. She's my favorite person. I know Sagittarius plays well. Sagittarius? <laughs> okay, hold on. My bad, I didn't mean to do a world call. Okay, guys, 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 guys. We're getting, we're getting off script. We're getting a script. We're getting a script. Hold on. Right now, as you are building your business in your current, this current day, who's inspiring you? Um, I. And like, most people don't give flowers to their peers. Like they just, they just don't do it. It's like a weird thing. I'm just like when I say who inspires you. Most times you ask that question, people talk about people from the past. Oh, got you. Like, yeah. who's, who's inspiring you right now as you wake up every day building your business that you're looking at going, this is what we're doing, and I, and I respect what they're doing? Yeah, I mean, you mentioned Angie um, from mm -hmm. The Shade Room, and I think that the business that she's building and her, just her commitment to retaining ownership and, and making sure that she feels... Uh, properly represented is, uh, I, I think, really ad admirable. Um, I love, uh, I mean, I, I have so much respect for Donald Glover. I've been a fan of his for a very long time. And just uh, I really like the way that he thinks and what he creates. Um, I love, been for a very long time, Quinta Brenson, who has Abbott Elementary right now. And Quinta, there's nobody who understands the internet better than her and who uses it better than her and who's just a genuine, genuinely talented, dope person. Like watching that show, I just, I just, I, I love her. You know, you can't, you can't, you can't beat that. Uh, and to watch someone fulfill their purpose and, and to see what else she's gonna do. Um, there's so many, there are honestly so many people so That's many great. peers that, that I respect. Uh, I'm trying to think of someone on the, the music side, but there's just so many. I love everything that Top Dog is doing. Um, Top is doing? Top so, Dog is doing, yeah, yeah, Top yeah, yeah Dog for is sure, doing. for sure. That Kendrick album coming out. Yeah. Is, this, is it his last one? Is it his last one with Top Dog? It's next week. Next week? Yeah. That was announced? Is it what? It was announced? I didn't know that he had an album. No, he announced, yeah, he announced that early. Wow, I missed that. You definitely was in the lab. I was over here worried about scissors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, for me, I, I really love, not that you asked me the question, but I'll no, answer No, I would it. love to know. Yeah, I, I love what the guys are doing uh, at QC. 
uh, with Little Baby and yep. what they've built down there, City Girls. Shout out to uh, City as, Girls. As a music company. And the fact that they're trying to really expand and, and bring media to the South. Um, I have a lot of respect for those guys. I think what LeBron and Maverick doing is special. Um, yes. Like, you know, just, just fighting the fight every day. Believing in the, uh, the values. Um, I think Michael B. Jordan is a powerhouse. Um, like when you speak, <laughs> when you speak to him, I mean, you, you know, you speak to him, he's super focused. Yep. He's super focused Same on the goal. Focus. And very similar to you, he's holding Hollywood accountable to Definitely. standards. Yeah, he's holding accountable, uh, Hollywood accountable. So I respect, those are the people I respect in, 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 in different industries. There's, there's many more. Is there anybody who's coming up that you have your eye on? Who's Steve watching? That's not, it's a good question. Honestly, just to hit the stream of thought button that you hit earlier, I'm just so committed to what I'm doing and trying to stay fresh, or staying fresh actually, that I'm lockstep with what's happening next. Like I'm really in it with what's happening next, and I try my best to, to, to not put what I love or my era of music or my era of values on the next generation. I give myself to them and see how I could be of service to them. And, and that's how I, that, that's how I, that, that's really how I uh, stay in tune with what's going on. So I haven't seen anyone in a minute. I haven't seen the next person that's, you know, not in the advertising business right. or in the music business yet. I haven't seen them. There, there are people in the music business that I love. Like, I will tell you, um, uh, two weeks ago, I spent a lot of time with Little Baby. And I was very, very impressed with him. Like, just showing up on time, professionalism. That matters. In the music no, no, industry, no, no, but like literally, late. No, no, like literally on time, professionalism, really cared about what he was doing, talked to me about real estate, and asked all the right questions. And I was impressed by him because he reminded me of, a, those are questions that Jay would have asked when he was 27 years old. And Little Baby was asking those questions now. And he's one of the few artists that I've seen of this generation that you could clearly get was creative, but like had an entrepreneurial spirit inside of him and, wanted, and was curious about the business. And um, so I would say like guys like him, mm -hmm. but generally speaking, I'm looking. I, I, I want to find and I want to help uh, what's next. I'm not one of those type of people who um, is holding on to what I am or what I was. I want to help bring the next generation forward. And we have a lot of beautiful people in this, in, in this room today who helped put this on, who work for Translation and United Masses. You guys all know who you are. My man Dave just had a birthday yesterday. He's in the building. Happy but, birthday. Uh, happy birthday to you, Dave. Um, so, like, that, Dreamville is dope. J. Cole is dope. I mean, by the way, I just said it. Everybody's moving towards ownership. You guys are seeing it. People want to own their masters. They fighting for it. That's what we all got to do. We got to walk in the door demanding ownership. That's what she's doing. And when she opens up the door, anybody in the film business, the production business, she's opening up the door so you can run up in that shit and get it for yourself. You know what I'm saying? That's what this is all about. This is not about opening the door and closing it and want to be the only black person in the, in the white neighborhood. <laughs> this is about opening the door and letting everybody in so we all have a fair opportunity to realize our potential. All right? You have any closing words? Um, well, I just want to say thank you so much for having me. I feel like, you know, the, the person that you're looking for is in this room. And, uh, you know, I constantly stress the importance of connecting with the people around you. I think your next business partner is in this room. I think the next person who's going to make you a millionaire, billionaire could be in this room. Um, no one is beneath you. No one is above you. 
and, you know, make it work. Work with each other to make it work. Put a hand up for that. Yeah. And I just want to thank, I want to thank you for coming out here and giving, literally giving of yourself to everybody, to the team at United Masters, to like, I told you backstage, we just want to educate, give people free game, and watch the come up. And the fact that you came here to do that, that's, I appreciate that. So I'm thank you for that. I'm honored to be here. Um, by the way, thank you, Diageo. Thank you, Ally. Thank you, Twitch. Thank you for all of our partners for a successful select con. Let's go party, guys. Thank you all so much. Look, dog.